everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. In this video, I want to talk about the rainbow prophecy and how it relates to the second coming in the last days. This was brought up by Lon Allen in an email. And uh, I actually think I've seen this uh, question come up a couple times in the comments section. And so here we go. I'm doing it now. I've pulled everything together that I can so we can look into this and see where this comes from and so forth. And, uh, okay, so let's just get into it. So this first um, reference comes from the Scripture Citation Index, Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 340, and it's this section called Mission of Messiah. And I want to read this whole section. It's not very long, but there's a lot of good things in here. So let's just get into it. The spirit of Elias is, f is first, Elijah second, and Messiah last. Elias is a forerunner to prepare the way, and the spirit and power of Elijah is to come after, holding the keys of power, building the temple to the capstone, placing the seals of the Melchizedek priesthood upon the house of Israel, and making all things ready. Then Messiah comes to his temple, which is last of all. Messiah is above the spirit and power of Elijah, for he made the world and was that spiritual rock unto Moses in the wilderness. Elijah was to come and prepare the way and build up the kingdom before the coming of the great day of the Lord, although the spirit of Elias might begin it. So it, it, it began with the spirit of Elias. I have asked of the Lord concerning his coming. And while asking the Lord, he gave a sign and said, quote, In the days of Noah, I set a bow in the heavens as a sign and token that in any year that the bow should be seen, the Lord would not come, but there should be seed time and harvest. So in any year that the bow should be seen, the Lord would not come. Um, so I'm assuming that this is not speaking to just one person or one group. Uh, it sounds like it's, it's like a general principle. And I don't know if this is based off of the Gregorian calendar or the Hebrew calendar, but since he's talking to Joseph Smith, it would make sense that he's probably referring to the Gregorian calendar because that's the calendar that Joseph Smith was operating off of. Okay. These are, these are just assumptions, but I, I think that it's the most lo logical conclusion. And I think it, it applies probably to uh, everybody, to the whole world. Um, okay, let's go on to the next page here. That year. But whenever you see the bow withdrawn, uh, now see, the you, I don't know if that's talking just to Joseph Smith or to like the office, the office of the president of the church or if it's talking to everybody. Um, I'm going to say probably talking to everybody. Uh, this is like a revelation for everybody. I don't know. But whenever you see the bow withdrawn, it shall be a token that there shall be famine, pestilence, and great distress among the nations, and that the coming of the Messiah is not far distant. Now, in this case, he doesn't say that it will be that year. It says that, um, that there shall be famine, pestilence, and great distress among the nations, and that the coming of the Messiah is not far distant. But if we go back here, it does say, um, in, the, in the days of Noah, I set a bow in the heavens as a sign and token that in any year that the bow should be seen, the Lord will not come. So it, do, it does seem that it, if you see the rainbow, the Lord will not come that year. Okay. Okay, but I will take the I will take the responsibility upon myself to prophesy in the name of the Lord that Christ will not come this year, as Father Miller has prophesied. And this was a guy that had made calculations and I guess a, a timeline, and said that Christ was coming in that year, 1844. So that's what he's talking about. Um, as Father Miller has prophesied, for we have seen the bow. And I also prophesy in the name of the Lord that Christ will not come in 40 years uh, from that time, from uh, 1844. 
and it turns out that that was true. And if God ever spoke by my mouth, he will not come in that length of time. Brethren, when you go home, write it down that it may be remembered. Jesus Christ never did reveal to any man the precise time that he would come. Go and read the scriptures and you cannot find anything that specifies the exact hour he would come. And all that say so are false teachers. Now, this is interesting because I've done a video specifically on um, a quote from Joseph Smith saying that he was responding to the idea that no man can know the day or the hour. And he said that Christ, when he was saying that, he was saying that to that current generation. But he wasn't saying it as a general uh, concept. And he points out the fact that in Amos, it says that God will not do anything until he reveals his secret to the prophets. And that was brought up recently in this last general conference by Elder Christoffel Golden, uh, where he, he pointed that out in his talk about the second coming. And he pointed out the Joseph Smith translation that um, clarified that the Lord will not do anything until he reveals it to his servants, the prophets. So, in this case right here, I believe what Joseph Smith is saying is that you can't look at past scripture, um, you can't look at the Bible, and then come up with a timeline and figure out the exact day that it's going to happen. Okay, It hasn't been revealed in the Bible. However, with a living prophet before this happens, and maybe just to that one prophet who will be the prophet of the second coming, the Lord's going to reveal what he's about to do. And even then, he may not reveal the exact day or hour, but uh, I think the prophet's going to know at the very least uh, the year that it's going to happen. Um, it sounds like all of us are going to know because we're not going to see a rainbow. But anyway, so it's just kind of, it's interesting. Um, it seems that the prophet can know and probably will know and maybe currently does know. Um, but as far as trying to figure out an exact date using the Bible, uh, that's it's not going to happen, according to Joseph Smith. Okay, and then he says... There are some important things concerning the office of the Messiah in the organization of the world, which I will speak of hereafter. May God Almighty bless you and pour out his spirit upon you is the prayer of your unworthy servant. Amen. Okay, so this is uh, the basis. This is the, the source. This is the original place where this comes from. Joseph Smith himself. Uh, and then you can find this, Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 341, uh, which is in the Scripture Citation Index. Okay, And then, uh, apparently the church was confident enough about it to put it in the Sunday School Manual, when in Sunday School we were going through the Teachings of the Prophets, and we were going each year, there was one prophet that we were studying. Well, this one was under... Teachings of the Presence of the Church, Joseph Smith. Okay, and it has the quote that we just read. And so, um, now, now the way that I look at it, frankly, is that anything that can be officially credited to Joseph Smith is true. He's the prophet of this dispensation. Okay, it, it, he wasn't really ever, that I know of, really uh, speaking from speculation. Well, I think he did sometimes, but he would he would actually he would say that. But when he says something like what we just read where he received uh inspiration from the Lord himself, like a revelation from the Lord that we we can trust that. Um other other contemporaries of his like Orson Pratt and um uh, people like that, I take what they say a little bit more with a grain of salt because they didn't have the same authority. And I think that a lot of them were, whenever they said things, <clears throat> excuse me, they were um, essentially speaking to the best of their knowledge and understanding. I think that there were some things that they didn't have quite yet, quite right yet. And it's my view that the church over time has kind of solidified its understanding of certain gospel principles that not not everything was exactly clear in the very beginning of this dispensation but as time went on 
as as church leaders have had a chance to research and pray and discuss, things have become more clear. So I, I hope that makes sense. You don't have to think that way, but that that's how I view things. Okay. Now another interesting thing that he said here. This is kind of off topic, but and I, and I've I've um, brought this up one time, but there's this idea that the sign of the Son of Man will be the city of Enoch, where which I don't. I don't know where that comes from, but in this um, same manual here, quoting Joseph Smith, it says, okay, it'll take some time to rebuild the walls of the city, talking about Jerusalem and the temple, etc. And all this must be done before the Son of Man will make his appearance. There will be wars and rumors of wars, signs in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Um, okay, then will appear one grand sign of the Son of Man in heaven. But will, what will the world do? Uh, they will say it is a planet, a comet, etc. But the Son of Man will come as the sign of the coming of the Son of Man, which will be as the light of the morning cometh out of the east. So, right here, Joseph Smith is saying that the Son of Man is the sign, the sign of the Son of Man, <laughs> uh, which makes sense because it's it's called and named the sign of the Son of Man. So, where the city of Enoch has been inserted here, I, I don't really understand that. But, um, you know, whatever. Okay. And then, for, for that um, quote that we just read from Joseph Smith, uh, this was written down also by John S. Fulmer. See, Disc Discourse, 10 March, 19, or 1844, as reported by John S. Fulmer. And I just want to read this too. Uh, <clears throat> this is in the Joseph Smith papers. Prophecy delivered by President Joseph Smith, March 10th, 1844, while inquiring of the Lord concerning the end of time, it was made known, made known to him by the Holy Spirit that there should be prosperity, seed time, and harvest every year in which the rainbow was seen. For to that was Noah referenced or referred as a surety on this subject. But in the in the year when the the bow was not to be seen, uh, would commence desolation, calamity, and distress among the nations without seed time or harvest, and that the revelation of the Son of Man from heaven would not be in this year, nor the next. Uh, he would say this. He would say to his Millerite friends that it would not be. In forty years to come, he uttered all this in the name of the Lord, and said, "We we should go home and write it." <laughs> so it looks like that's what he did. Um, now, don't don't get confused here because when he's saying that it's not going to happen uh, this year nor the next, and then not in forty years, he's talking about that year, eighteen forty four, because that's what Joseph Smith was saying to the Millerites and to other, and, and also to members of the church, like, don't, you guys, it's not going to happen this year or the next, and it's not going to happen in 40 years. So he's not saying that when you don't see the rainbow, then, you know, count 40 years. He's just talking about back then in 1844. Okay, and then Bruce R. McConkie is quoted here in, um, it's the Doctrine of the Gospel Student Manual, this is on the church website, and it's a quote from the Millennial Messiah, uh, the book that he wrote uh, about, about the Second Coming. Okay, quote, At the time appointed by the Father, the Son of Man will come in the clouds of heaven. It is unknown, it is, it is an unknown day in the beginning of the seventh, seventh thousand years of the earth's temporal continuance. War such as which such has not been known from the beginning of time is in progress. All nations are assembled at Armageddon. And uh, just as a side note, again, at the time of this recording, the invasion of Ukraine has not happened yet, and and it may it's, it I don't it may not happen, but I think the chances are very very slim that it's not going to happen. Uh, and I've done a couple videos now about how. This is a very serious situation. I don't know if it could lead um, to World War III if somehow the conflict expands beyond Ukraine. And I'm not saying that it will. And I, I don't think that it will, but I'm not going to say that it can't. 
Um, but anyway, that's just kind of something to think about right now. Anyway, let's continue. All things are in commotion. Never has there been such a day as this. The newspapers of the world, as well as radio and television, and uh, also the internet, but Bruce R. McConkie didn't know that, um, speak only of war and calamity and the dread that hangs like a millstone around every neck. And the signs in heaven above are like nothing man has ever seen. Blood is everywhere. Fire and vapors of smoke fill the atmospheric heavens. No man has seen a rainbow this year. Now, I don't think he's like necessarily prophesying. This might be his point of view or his, his best guess. But in order for fire and vapors of smoke, uh, I'm assuming that he's like talking about uh, warfare. Um, the only way that that can happen, in, in my understanding, is through nuclear warfare, where we have like a, a nuclear winter. That's the concept where uh, if you have so many um, nuclear weapons going off, if there's enough, they could throw up so much dirt and dust into the atmosphere that it would block out the sun. And then, of course, there would be no rainbow because of that. So, if that's what he's talking about, he, he's basically talking about a nuclear holocaust. And I don't think that he's like prophesying it because I, I don't think that he necessarily has the authority to do that. Um, you know, he is, this is probably his guess. I don't even know if that's exactly what he's saying, but he just was just talking about war and calamity. And then after that, he's talking about fire and vapors of smoke. Of course, maybe he's talking about natural occurrences. And th that is one way that it could happen. So I guess there's a few different ways it could happen. It could happen as a result of a, a nuclear winter. Um, it could also happen as a result of um, things like uh, the the Yellowstone supervolcano going off. Uh, I think it's been talked about how that could potentially cause um a blocking out of the sun worldwide. I don't know if it, it would do it worldwide, but whatever the case, there there might be something like that uh, or a combi combination of things like that that could make this happen. Uh, one, or, one other thought that I've had, okay, because here you go. Here's like the science behind rainbows. I decided to look this up. Here's a, a water droplet. And here you see the, the white light from the sun coming in. And then it gets bounced off the back of the water droplet. And then at a 42 degree angle. So it, it depends on where you're standing. Okay. It's relative to you. But uh, the angle is 42 degrees. And then the white light is separated into the different colors of the rainbow. Uh, in fact, I'm not even going to, I'm not going to read this because I just explained it, but that, that's what it is. So one thing that's interesting is that for a rainbow to occur, uh, the way that we traditionally think of rainbows, not using like uh, prisms, you know, having actual moisture in the air, water droplets, you have to have the sun and then you have to have water droplets in the air. Um yeah, and that's it. And then an observer. And we know that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth at this time. Uh, now, it seems like it's going to happen after Christ comes, but maybe as the new heaven and new earth are happening, uh, maybe something's going on with the sun. Maybe something's going on with the atmosphere and the earth itself. To, uh, some kind of condition in which this process would be disrupted. Maybe the cult there would, maybe there wouldn't be any more white light coming from the sun, or maybe the sun wouldn't even be there because things are changing in the heavens. I don't know, but that's that's one possibility. So it could be nuclear war, it could be natural disasters like super volcanoes, or it could be simply the changing of the heavens from one heaven to a new heaven, maybe during that transition process, or or maybe the Lord himself coming, maybe that would somehow affect the phenomena of rainbows. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Um, and above all are the vexing words of those Mormon elders. They are everywhere preaching their strange doctrine, saying that the coming of the Lord is near, and that unless men repent and believe the gospel, 
the gospel, they will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. In this setting, as these and 10,000 like, like things are in progress, suddenly, quickly, is as from the midst of eternity he comes. Fire burns before him, tempests spread destruction, the earth trembles and reels to and fro as a drunken man. Every corruptible thing is consumed. He sets his foot on the mount called Olivet. It cleaves in twain. The Lord has returned, and the great millennium is here. The year of his the year of his redeemed has arrived. Okay. So uh, so that's it. That's what I was able to find. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some other quotes out there. But this is one that I accept because it seems to be firmly rooted in authoritative sources. Okay. The fact, first of all, the fact that Joseph Smith himself said it, you know, it's in the scripture citation index, it's in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. The fact that it's been requoted in the Sunday school manual for all the church to read, which I'm not saying that the manuals are infallible, whether it's a Sunday school manual or institute or seminary manual. I think that there are occasionally mistakes or uh, it, they're not perfect books, but I, I do think that nevertheless, it gives it more credibility. So Joseph Smith and the credit that I give to him saying anything, secondly, it being repeated in the Sunday school manual. Um, and then it's documented here as well that, you know, John S. Fulmer did in fact hear him say it and it's recorded. And then Bruce R. McConkie put it in his book, Millennial Messiah, which I'm not saying that that's infallible either, but I do think that it's generally pretty correct. Um, and then they put it in Doctrines of the Gospel Student Manual. Okay, so it does seem like this is an official doctrine of the church. Um, it, it's said by Joseph Smith himself uh, back in the beginning of this, this dispensation, and it's repeated again uh, in more recent times. So those are my thoughts on it. Uh, I don't know how it's going to happen, but we've discussed three different possibilities, and maybe there's more. But um, And again, we don't know all the specific details. Uh, it probably is referring to the Gregorian calendar, uh, like I said, because the Lord was talking to Joseph Smith and that was the calendar he was on. Or uh, maybe we don't know that detail. Maybe it's based on maybe it's based on the Hebrew calendar, uh, which in which case the new year starts generally either in um, I think Rosh Hashanah usually floats between September and October. Most of the time it's in September. Uh, I think uh, less often it happens in October. So if that's the case, then I mean, whatever, you know, you get what I'm saying. Okay, so that's all I have for this one. So you're going to have to let me know what you think in the comments below. Uh, if you have any additional thoughts, information, or just anything that you'd like to add. Uh, if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it, and make sure to share it. And I'll talk to you guys later.